Welcome to Center of Light, Keith Anthony Blanchard here, Center of Divine Foldment and Reinforcement. Strapping all my brother and sisters as we launch for inner space. Homecoming, crossing the bridge to the soul, doing very, very well. Thank you, all of my Yanavite tribe supporters. You are loved beyond measure, at least by me. And I'm sure the universe has the same <laughs> sentiment. Thank you for being here. Uh, I think I'm going to get back into Center of Light Radio really heavily. I'm, I really enjoy it. I got some new cool equipment, all this kind of bells and whistles, which I love. I love bells and whistles. Everybody likes sprinkles in their ice cream. Well, whatever. <laughs> Tonight, my guest is Mr. Paul Wallace, and we're going to be speaking about his phenomenal book, Escaping from Eden. This is going to be a ride. Welcome. We're going to all go for a ride. Homecoming doing very well. It reached number six. An Amazon's bestseller. Let me uh, take care of a little something, something. It reached number six in Amazon's bestseller as of now in the UK. Love it. I think that is bestseller status. It's fun. It's cool. It opens doors. Um, I think no different from my guest tonight. Mr. Paul Wallace. I think his book is bestseller. He's been on George Nori. Hello, Gaia TV, as far as I am remembering correctly if i remember correctly i'm gonna read his bio shortly and i think that in, entails all of that a few nights ago like i normally do which is a bunch of nothing <laughs> usually when i get hits if you will from spirit i'm usually doing absolutely nothing most likely going to the bathroom i have no no agenda i have no thoughts in mind except to go void my bladder or my body or whatever and I hear tomorrow, there's, he didn't, it didn't say explosion. It said tomorrow, a very large bomb is going to go off. Bomb explosion are sort of the same words with two different intentions. Explosion means something happens. Bomb means something else. I was actually going to do a presentation about it and I thought it was just too dark and it wasn't going to go to a place I really wanted to go. So I didn't do it. Point is, being around Swamji Visayogi, I'm, I'm getting the feeling that he's starting to show up in a very um, present, conscious way with me, uh, for us, with us, um, that things are changing in such a way as to why I would be disclosed with such information only to have it happen the next day. That being said, um, there's a lot happening. A lot happening. Are you okay? My love is with you. My support is with you. Are you okay? Do you feel okay? Is the real question. Um, I had a major computer update a week ago. Oh my God. It shifted everything. I had to redo everything and get different structures and different ways of doing things. But I'm back here. And as I said just a little earlier, I am going to start doing Center of Light Radio a lot more often. In fact, the whole month of August is booked Tuesdays and Thursdays, 7 o'clock p.m. Central Time. I think it's time to get down to some Center of Light Radio beeswax. Let me tell you about my guest tonight. My guest is Mr. Paul. I love his middle name. His middle name is Anthony. <laughs> Paul Anthony Wallace. Let me tell you about Paul Anthony Wallace. And we're going to be talking about his book tonight, Escaping from Eden. Let me make sure my mic is not muted, which lots of stuff. Here we go. Paul Anthony Wallace is a popular speaker, researcher, and author of books on spirituality and mysticism. My kind of cat. Today, his work probes world mythology and ancestral narratives for the collective memory of human origins and their insights for developing our human potential. Paul's book, Escaping from Eden, has been hailed by George Norrie from Coast to Coast. The most popular talk show in the world has been for years. An audience, live audience of 15 plus million. That's ridiculous numbers, man. As this generation's chariots of fire, Paul is a regular voice in the Paranormal Chronicles and the Fifth Kind TV in collaboration with Gaia TV. Wow. Paul practices personal coaching with a few clients each year. He is a musician. 
I think he and I talked about that a little bit. He is a musician. I'm doing multiple tasking things. A mystic, a healing practitioner in the Christian tradition. What? I love it. An enthusiastic chef. Come on now. Dude, you need to quit. And a barefoot walker. We need to ask him about a barefoot walker. It sounds exactly what it is, but I'm sure there's more to it. Paul is married with three children, and he lives in, down under in Australia. Let me give you his website. Everyone, please go stomp all over his page and make a huge stank. Let me get my friend, Mr. Paul Wallace, on the line. Welcome to Center of Light Radio. Everyone, Keith Anthony Blanchard here. Let's speak to my brand new friend. G'day, Keith. Good day, my brother. How are you on this fine for you morning? <laughs> for I'm me, it's really, afternoon. I'm really well. It's it's a cold, dark, and rainy morning actually, but it is morning here in Australia. And you are in the capital, is that correct? That's right, Canberra in the Australian Capital Territory. And you've been there how long, my friend? I've been in Australia twenty years. Uh, grew up in the UK. Uh, commuted for about 10 years between the UK and Canada, uh, Montreal. And then 20 years ago, I came out to Australia and it's been here ever since. Wonderful. Let me ask my audience real quick. As I said earlier, before you got on the air, sir, uh, that you and I talked about in the radio green room a little earlier, that things had got shifted when I had a major update. Can everyone, just one or two of you here, Paul's dialogue against mine, everything is fine. Just send me an exclamation point. Just one or two of you. Paul, when I read your bio before I brought you on, sir, uh, all of it was delicious. I love the fact that you are a cook. <laughs> a cook? I'm sorry. <laughs> that you are a chef. You, yeah, you don't work in a cafeteria. But that you are a chef. A chef and you in have, my own house. <laughs> <laughs> that you have all these wonderful um, notches on your belt, so to speak. But one that really intrigued me was you are a barefoot walker. And I understand the barefoot walking bit. But I know it's deeper than that, knowing you and this awesome book, which you're going to be speaking about tonight, Escaping from Eden. What is a barefoot walker, sir? Well, you know, there are some people who just like to be barefoot, and they can't always explain why that's the case. And all through my life, I, I like to be barefoot. I didn't like wearing shoes. And then just a few years ago, I discovered what that might be about because I started suffering from sleep apnea. And uh, my wife persuaded me to try an earthing mat uh, on our bed, which means that as well as connecting with the earth by walking barefoot, you're actually connecting with the earth when you sleep. And as soon as I did that, my sleep apnea stopped and I realized something amazing had happened. So I, I had to do some backwards thinking and thinking, why is this working? Because I had no expectation it would work. And I understand it has to do with looking after the electromagnetic field of your body and that one way you can look after it is to walk barefoot. And your body uses that field uh, to, to stay healthy and to, to function really well. So if you're a barefoot walker and you're wondering why, that's the reason. You're looking after your body, you're looking after your electromagnetic field. But it was the sleep apnea fixing that showed me that something there's something real associated with it. It's not just a, like a fashion choice. I love that you brought home, connected the two and revealed that what happens in the mind happens in the body, happens in the world. And what was happening in the mind or the body, you were just simply not connecting by choice in the mind and the body would follow suit, not walking barefoot and then the mind makes a new choice you know i want to do something about this i heard about walking barefoot and you do and it happens on a spiritual level i love this interwoven this symbi uh, symbiotic relationship between the different bodies and just a simple play of energy on all levels yeah that's very true and it's it's only recently i realized there's a connection between that and my book escaping from eden because i had a particular period where i, I really wanted to refresh myself. I had a very pressured time at work. And so I was doing more barefoot walking. I was walking out in nature, out in the bush and doing some other things just to uh, look after myself better. And it was in the aftermath of all that, that a new focus came and I started getting the clarity that led to escaping from Eden. I love that you opened up the chakras in your feet. 
grounding to Mother Earth. Can let me ask you this, and I, I, I'm assuming I know the answer, but let's, let me ask you before I get myself into trouble. As you started doing this, you can begin to feel not only a change in you, but you can could you could you actually feel information, light, wisdom coming through your feet up into your consciousness when i say up as if the consciousness is in the head <laughs> but can you feel information coming in from gaia uh into your being that you now made your feet vulnerable so to speak can you feel that well it's so interesting you describe it that way i couldn't feel it physically through my feet but new information did start flowing because Immediately after I started doing more barefoot walking, uh, sleeping on my earthing mat, walking in nature, I had a sudden sequence of what some people might consider paranormal experiences, which was a flow of information, not just ideas and thoughts, but remote viewings, experiences of precognition. Now, I've had 33 years in Christian ministry, and those phenomena are part of the experience of a pastor but suddenly I was getting a, an amazing flow of these things and they didn't fit my old boxes, my old grid. I realized something <laughs> in my brain, <laughs> something in my brain was shifting and I was experiencing a different kind of consciousness to what I'd enjoyed before. So I, I hadn't uh, identified it in that physical way of coming up through the feet, but that's what happened. Did you and I have a week or so ago when we spoke and we met, we had a have our chat did we talk about your christian background and a pastor kind of thing did we did we touch on that i can't remember but that's that's been my work background for 33 years i've, I've worked as a a pastor a church doctor theological educator i've trained people in the interpretation of ancient texts and in the history of christian thought and i've worked as an archdeacon for the anglican church here in australia and uh, I, I like to mention that because it actually makes somewhat surprising uh, the tra trajectory that's taken by my new book, Escaping from Eden. When you find out what's in that, you'll think, how's that coming from a church background? And it's, uh, it's, it's fun to join the dots and work out how those things go together or not, as the case may be. How did you get on this far in, far out path? writing such a phenomenal book that's doing well how, how did you how's your book doing very well moving about uh, as it should escaping from eden is doing really really well we're selling uh about 100 copies a day at the wow. moment which is fantastic it's a really good rate and uh, you probably know keith as a writer that if, if you want to be a new york times bestseller you have to sell about 150 a day uh for the first few weeks so so we're we're between 100 and 150, so we're, we're doing really well and uh, hopefully building even further. Congratulations. Listen, the beginning of the book, Encountering Eric Von Doniken at Age 11. Noting the extraordinary 2009 colloquium of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, Recovery from Energy. What's that? Well, yes, Recovery from Injury is um, in the book I talk about um, suffering... Um, a, an ultimate frisbee uh, injury and uh, really ultimate frisbee in case you don't know is like it's a combination of of frisbee and uh, rugby uh, so we play frisbee rough in australia so but it's really a code for the times when uh, i've taken time out <laughs> i can actually I've picture had... that paul <laughs> yes it's extreme uh, but it i use it as a code for times when the universe has given me some time to take some time out and do some study and drill down into some questions. And there were questions that I journeyed with for a long time that, as you say, dated all the way back to when I was 11 years old and I was at a dinner party hosted by my mum and dad and they were discussing uh, the Book of the Hour, which was Chariots of the Gods by Eric von Daniken. It was really charting at that time. It had been out for about 10 years, but I think the movie had come out. People were talking about it. And my ears pricked up because I had always felt there was a gap in our ability to explain ourselves as an intelligent, conscious, technological species. How come we're here at the top of the food chain when we're really quite ill-adapted to planet Earth? 
I mean, all the other animals can live quite happily in the wild. Uh, if I were left in the wild after three days, three nights, I'd be very sick, hospitalized, or I'd be dead. Uh, we're not very well adapted without our technology. We need our clothing, we need our fire, we need our shelter, we need our weapons. And I felt that Eric von Däniken had identified this gap. I was going to a, a church school, a Church of England school at the time, and when I heard religious explanations of where we all came from, they sounded a bit lazy. Oh, God made us. And the good word, sir. Good, yeah. Very good word to describe that. Thank you. It just didn't explain why we are so clearly a type of animal. Why are we so similar to the other animals if we're this unique, one-off uh, miraculous creation by God. And then when I went to science, I found there was a gap there in, in explaining why we're so different. How come all of a sudden there's us, <laughs> the species with high intelligence, consciousness, and technology? And Eric von Daniken in that book said there's a gap. And he put forward evidences that really gave plenty of reason for us to consider whether there might have been an intervention in our evolution as a species and whether that intervention had come from off planet. I just let that rumble away in the back of my mind for the next umpteen decades, but it certainly raised for me the possibility that we might live in a populated universe and we might have some connection with the other species that may be out there. And then the colloquium that you mentioned in 2009, that was the real prompt to me that I needed to get back to this topic and think about it because you know, when you're a pastor, as in most jobs, you get very, very busy and you don't have the time to follow up on all your questions and interests. But something happened in 2009 that I thought, oh my goodness, I need to look into this. What happened was the Pope, Pope Benedict XVI, the most conservative Pope in my lifetime, called on the Pontifical Academy of Sciences to convene a colloquium. So this is a symposium of top scholars, top theologians, and they had five days of closed sessions to discuss, and they made very public what they were talking about. There's a huge build-up to it for about a year, telling us what they're gonna be discussing. The theological implications of contact with other civilizations. Well, my jaw dropped when I heard this, because it was only 400 years ago, the same institution, was burning people at the stake for merely suggesting there might be intelligent life on other planets. 1600, Giordano Bruno, an early adopter of Copernicus, was arguing that uh, the Earth orbits the sun, not the other way around, that the other stars are suns like our own. They have planets orbiting them, and they have civilizations on them that are quite probably more advanced than our own. And so he was brutally executed to send a signal for the next 400 years to people around the world that that is not something we discuss uh, as good Catholics. And then all of a sudden in 2009, this conservative Pope is saying, oh no, we should put all that back on the table. We should be talking about it. And spokespeople came out, uh, senior spokespeople. So you know they were speaking for the Vatican when they said these things. Uh, we had uh, Monsignor um, Corrado Balducci, who is a senior exorcist, uh, expert in the paranormal for the Roman Catholic Church. He came out and said, when people report close encounters, whoa, we're right in the deep end here. Uh, when people report close encounters, it's not a psychological issue. It's not a psychotic break. It's not a demonic experience. They are encountering a totally different kind of entity, one that merits serious study. Jose Gabriel Funes, the director of the Vatican Observatory, said we shouldn't be surprised to encounter extraterrestrials and we should regard them as brothers we sh and sisters. We should be ready to embrace a brother or sister alien. Reverend Dr. Guy Consolmagno, who's the senior astronomer uh, for the Vatican Observatory, said we shouldn't be surprised to meet them. We shouldn't call them aliens because they'd be children of the same Heavenly Father. We shouldn't be surprised because they're in the Bible, he said. That was yummy. <laughs> they're, they're in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Well, it was when Guy Consolmagno, who's a great theologian, said that, that I thought, wait a minute. Aliens in the Bible, I've been lecturing for 15 years 
on the principles of interpreting the Bible, could I really have missed something as glaring as aliens in the Bible? It was clearly a gauntlet being thrown down for us to go back and look again. So when I suffered my injury from the ultimate Frisbee match, had a time to convalesce, that's what I did. I sat down with my Bible, my interlinear, my Greek and Hebrew dictionaries, and drilled down into the text. I had an idea that there may be maybe an alien or two rumbling around in the text somewhere. People who read the Bible will think straight away <laughs> of Genesis 6, where this strange other species turns up and interbreeds and hybridizes with human beings. And I thought, well, maybe he's talking about that. But in fact, when I went back and actually did the work, went as far as looking at the translation of these ancient texts and the sources behind them, I realized that the E.T. narrative begins in the first two sentences of the book of Genesis, and it doesn't disappear until the end of Revelation. And it was doing that translation work. It was like taking the red pill in the Matrix. Dig that. Um, so what are the first whole, two sentences? Remind me, what are the first two sentences of Genesis? For those what who are... happened, well, what happens in those sentences is is a couple of things. One I might come back to later because it's very intriguing. Before we get into any of the work of creation, let there be light, and there was light, and all that. Before all that happens, before the creation of light, sun, moon, stars, apparently planet Earth already exists, and it's flooded and shrouded in darkness. That's there before any of the story begins, and that ought to raise an eyebrow. I, I did some more work and more research that brought me back to ask, what kind of literature is this? Because as I've studied world mythologies, I now come to the text and I ask, what memory is being carried here? If this is a text carrying memory, if the planet exists before the so-called work of creation, what we're looking at is not a creation moment, it's a recovery moment. And it's a story of an intervention on planet Earth after a cataclysm, when life on Earth needs re-nurturing, when the Earth is shrouded in a pall of dust and ash and soot and flooded. And so people from somewhere else turn up to help us. And that story repeats in Genesis, in the Mesoamerican stories, in the Sumerian stories. So there's one little anomaly, but the real big uh, game-changing red pill is a word Elohim and from those first sentences onward it's a word that we're familiar with being translated as God but that translation is really really questionable because this word Elohim in some texts it's translated as God in others gods in the plural demons false gods angels, landlords, chieftains. How can it mean all those different things? And how do we know what it means in which text? When I went into the etymology of the word, I discovered that it means the powerful ones. The powerful ones, plural. It's a plural, masculine plural form. It takes plural verbs. It exhibits plural behaviors, plural agendas. And after I'd gone through a bit of study on this and uh, compared notes with some top theologians and scholars, I had to consider that the original form of these texts had Elohim as a plural, but it really did mean the powerful ones. What happens, I ask myself, if you go back and translate it that way every place it appears? Well, of course, if you translate Elohim as the powerful ones, the stories change, but they don't change in a random way. And as I went through that exercise, I discovered that you read the Elohim stories as the stories of the powerful ones. All of a sudden, they shift and they line up with the Sumerian, Babylonian, Arcadian, and Assyrian texts on which the Genesis stories are clearly based. Now, we didn't know that until the 1800s because we couldn't read the Sumerian, Babylonian, Arcadian, and Assyrian stories. We didn't have the translation key for all those cuneiform tablets that had been dug up. As soon as we did and started reading them, we started recognizing stories. Whoa, that sounds like the creation. That sounds like Adam and Eve. That sounds like Cain and Abel. That sounds like the limiting of human life. That sounds like the flood. That sounds like the Tower of Babel. And quickly we realized that the Genesis stories are a summary form of these old Mesopotamian stories. But the uh, lightning bolt, 
that comes with this revelation is that these source stories, these original stories, and we shouldn't be surprised that Genesis has them summarized because Abraham and Sarah, the progenitors of the Judeo-Christian tradition, came out of a Sumerian culture. They were a Semitic people, but they'd grown up in Ur of the Chaldees, and it was not surprising they would bring all their stories of beginnings with them. But their stories of beginnings, Sumerian, Babylonian, Arcadian, and Assyrian versions that we have, they're not stories about God. The stories on which our Genesis stories are based are stories of our ancestors bumping up against another species who have arrived on planet Earth from elsewhere to take over and colonize us and modify us as a species. And once you've seen that, you can't go back to seeing it the other way. You can't go back to translating Elohim as God because it becomes nonsense. And many of the anomalies uh, in Genesis as we know it that leave us asking, why did God do that? Why did he do something so violent? Why couldn't he foresee that was going to happen? He seems to be having an argument with himself here. All those things resolve <laughs> because you realize it's not the story of God. It's the stories of the powerful ones, a whole community of beings who are bumping up against each other as they manage Project Earth in the time of our distant ancestors. You know, Paul, in my first book, The Divine Principle, I'm having a conversation with Spirit. That's what the book is based on, a conversation for eight years in meditation. In this chapter called Creation versus Evolution, <laughs> talk about that was a, a Chinese arithmetic to put together. Uh, creation versus Evolution. Spirit and I, in this dialogue, Spirit says, Keith, I'm going to read you a passage, I'm paraphrasing, um, from Genesis. In the beginning was this, and it gets to the Adam and Eve part, and it says, go out and replenish the earth. And I say, okay, so what's your point? He says, did you not catch the magic word? And I said, no. He said, replenish. He said, if I wanted, if this was the beginning, basically, of everything, I would have had them go out and replenish the earth, not yeah. replenish. Not replenish. There are lots of little clues, that's right, that we're looking at reboots of planet Earth and reboots of civilization on Earth. And I think by the time we get to Genesis 11, that there are three planetary or civilization reboots that get referred to. There's the one in Genesis 1, uh, and then there's uh, the flood in Genesis 6, and then there's what happened uh, in the Babel story in Genesis 11. When you get further into the Bible, you find a book called Ecclesiastes, and the writer there says that we have no knowledge of what went before us in the past, and after a time, no one will have any recollection of us. Well, he's talking uh, in a world that has writing, that has history. He's not talking about individuals. He's not talking about kingdoms. I believe he's talking about civilizations coming and going and life on earth being booted and rebooted. And as soon as you start realizing that our Genesis stories parallel the narratives of mythologies all around the world, you soon find that certain other ancestral narratives are even clearer in that than the ones you and I might be familiar with. Go to the Vedas and they're very clear. We're looking at, at periodic reboots of life on earth. Go to Plato, writing 2,500 years ago. He was very developed on this, indeed. Now, Plato is foundational to Western thought. Every, yeah. every scholar knows how important he is, but they often put to one side some of the more challenging things he says. And one of the things he said 2,500 years ago is that our world is a planet. It is a globe floating vulnerably in space and that every so often we are affected by the movement of other objects in space, which cause cataclysms on planet Earth and take civilization down to a virtual zero to be reset and rebooted. And he said roughly every 5,000 years or so, something like that will happen. Plato had got that from ancient Egyptian knowledge. And where the Egyptians got that from, we, we, we might not be too sure. But that knowledge was there all that time ago when the Vedas were being written, when Plato was writing, that we're living on a world that every so often gets rebooted. And I believe that narrative is hidden in plain sight in the text of Genesis. Let me ask you this, Paul. So without blame and going into the nonsense of people 
being manipulative, none of that. But simply, what happened to these pretexts? Do you think they were lost in such cataclysms, like just buried in the ground? Uh, do you think they were lost because, uh, you know, dogs took their, their parents' homework? Or do you think that, some, that there was some hand involved? Uh, a little bit of all of it. I mean, where did the, these filler texts, that which is the final piece that puts the puzzle together... I mean, I understand that the divine, divine, the divine wants you to dig. It wants you to want it. So it seems poetic, right, or <laughs> ironic that those missing pieces are missing. And I've said in my work is that you know we're looking for the missing link, the missing link, the missing link, and, and a, an amoeba in the ocean, and or uh, some something from in the jungle that has this particular chemistry that can. I think the missing link is information. Yes, I, I, I think you're right. We're always seeking for it. But, you know, it's not so hidden. And there are clues, not only in our ancient texts, but in our sciences as well, that uh, begin to put this story together. In Escaping from Eden, I look at some archaeology, I look at some neuroscience, I look at some astrophysics, and there are clues in all these disciplines uh, that the old stories of our evolution being interfered with by visitors from somewhere else uh, may indeed be the case. One of the most surprising places I found as I, as I researched for Escaping from Eden was DNA research. And the eminence of scientists involved in DNA research who have not only believed, but they've put on record that they believe life on Earth did not originate here. It came from outer space. Francis Crick the co-discoverer of the double helix of DNA got the Nobel Prize in 1962 for it. From that moment on, argued that life on Earth did not originate here. It came from outer space. Carl Sagan, back in the 1960s, wrote on this and then published many articles that argued for it. Today, we have uh, Maxim Makulov, Vladimir Sherbak of the Fezenkov Astrophysical Institute and the Kazakh al farabi National University. They are leading, leading authorities in the human genome and DNA research. And not only do they repeat the idea that the genetic coding for intelligent life landed on planet Earth from somewhere else, that's the theory of panspermia, but they say there are clues in our DNA when we study it. There are repetitions of prime numbers in our DNA that they say are absolutely impossible if this was just a natural process that had gradually evolved. He's, they are saying it's like, it's like the engineers have left a little signature in there to say, we were here. And anyone who's seen the movie Contact well, remember how that goes, that there's a signal that's been broadcast to planet Earth. One of my absolute and favorite it's movies. Of prime numbers that clues us that it's not a natural signal, that this is a communication. And of course, we decode it and it's a message in the story. I won't spoil the story, but the story rolls on from there. This is Carl Sagan's uh, writing. It's on truly that. one of my favorite movies. And I absolutely adore profound. that movie. It's absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely profound. Well, what uh, Mikulov and Sherbak are saying is that that broadcast has been made. They're not talking about the wow signal of 1973 that, that may have inspired the movie Contact. They're talking about the signal in our DNA, this repetition of primes that tells us this is not naturally occurring. There is intelligent design in it, and there's been an intervention to ensure that we've turned out the way we have. Wow. It, to me, it, it makes, not only does it make sense, it just seems so natural that it didn't come from here. It's not, you know, I understand yeah. evolution. I don't dismiss evolution. I definitely don't dismiss, dismiss creation. But I think evolution is that which happens from the intention of creation. You know, there's a will brought forth and things begin to, and basically a big switch. Switch is thrown. Then everything evolves from that. I mean, Humans are evolving today, whether people agree with that or not. It, it's it's useless to argue because you're not the same person you were 10 years ago. You have evolved. You're not the same person you were a month and a week and yesterday. You have evolved. Things are evolving. You know, we look at the world 100 plus years ago. Look at the technology. It was, it was an iron horse. We called a train an iron horse. And now we have this thing that Tesla foresaw called a cell phone that would communicate with anyone all around the world. I mean, things are evolving on all levels. Now, to say that, um, you know, 
monkeys eventually turn into man and you know I, there's a lot of gray area in that but i think there's a beautiful marriage in creation and evolution versus the one or the other what are your thoughts on that sir well that's true i was really intrigued when i realized that uh, two and a half thousand years ago so long before charles darwin plato had some idea of our evolution because he then adds to it and says there was an intervention in our evolution so in his mind, we've not always been like this, that we were changing, we were developing, but that then something was added to that process by an intervention to make us more intelligent, more conscious, and more capable of technology, that that's his story. And then it's so counterintuitive to find, I think, when you go to ancient, ancient mythologies and hear them suggest that the life that's evolved on planet Earth didn't originate here. So there's a wonderful story from the Zulu people, uh, the story of Unkulunkulu, which talks about life arriving on planet Earth from outer space. And it's a beautiful cinematic picture they have of all the different forms of life arriving as seed pods. And you think, okay, that could be a description of panspermia, seed arriving in seed form. Yes, genetic coding arrives. It arrives on a planet with water. It generates forms of life. But actually, it's even more cinematic than that. This is like a Ridley Scott movie because what happens is these seed pods arrive and they're described for us. And they sound to me like stasis pods. And there are beings inside the stasis pods, gestating, in fact. So they're more than stasis. They're, they are gestational pods. And then when the creatures inside them are mature, ready to be birthed, the pods burst open and start populating the planet. Now, if you are an ancient people wandering around, living on the land, the land is all you've known, the animals that you uh, farm and feed off have always been there, you've never seen any change, and you're very tied to the land. That's what it's all about. That's how you live and survive and thrive. Why would you come up with a story saying all of this came from outer space and got plonked on the planet and had to adapt and habituate to this planet? And the correlations between that story and our sciences and mythologies all around the world. That's what began to get my attention because the repetitions brought me to that question of how can all these cultures with no contact with each other in the ancient past have developed such similar stories that are so counterintuitive? And the repetitions make me ask, is there memory in this that's being told? And what is the memory that's been carried? Let me ask you this, sir, being engaged as you are, so involved as you are, I can tell this is a passion of yours because you ooze it. <laughs> <laughs> Do I dare tread this ground? And I'm going to throw it out there anyway. Have you had your own personal experiences? I don't mean just being in the energy of writing and being around people, maybe at a particular event, a UFO, MUFON event, whatever those things are that you might attend in that way. Have you yourself had any sort of experience that you could share or choose to share as to why maybe this triggered you maybe from a young age? Uh, do you have any recollection of anything as such? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I'm actually, uh, <laughs> I'm teasing my readers with that question in the sequel to Escaping from Eden that I'm working on Understood. right now. Uh, it's funny you ask because when Escaping from Eden first came out, people started contacting me. Uh, I was doing interviews like this one, and then people would email me with their experiences. And from time to time, I'll be in conversation with people who have had experiences of close encounters, uh, abduction experiences, other paranormal experiences that they can't explain. And, and the power of taboo is still so strong that there are many, many people out there who've had these experiences and can't talk about them. And that's why they talk to people like you and me, because they feel I can finally tell the story to someone who who will listen to me and help me process it. So I, I've heard many, many stories. Some months it's every week, some weeks it's every day, contacted by people. And often, less so now, but certainly at the beginning, when the book first came out, people would sound me out with the question you've just asked. 
uh, to see if it's safe for them to share their experience. And initially, I'd say, no, no, I've never experienced a close encounter. No, I've, I've never seen a UFO. I, no, I haven't experienced a, 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 an encounter with an alien or anything like that. And then as the weeks and months went by, I began joining some dots uh, and realizing that um, I had three or four experiences in 1985 when I was a young man that at the time I couldn't explain and that have always puzzled me. And they puzzled me because by that time I was a... Uh, a Christian. I'd grown up as an atheist, but funnily enough, through through Eric von Danik and, and, and my reflection on that, I came to be a follower of Jesus. So by 1985, I was uh, living in a world of orthodox Christian faith where there's places for God, the devil, angels, demons, animal, vegetable, mineral, and nothing else. And so if you experience something that doesn't fit into those boxes, you try and force it in to one of those boxes. And without going into too much detail, I had experiences that didn't fit. I had an experience that I thought was a demonic encounter. And now looking back, I realize it can't have been. It was an encounter with something else. And I believe it was a close encounter. I just didn't have the grid for it at the time to describe it that way. These short gray entities that were in my apartment were not demons, they were something else. I now have the language to put to that experience. And then I had a couple of other experiences of, um, uh, oh, I don't, uh, how much will I tell? Because I really want to whet people's <laughs> appetite. You did I wonderful, I just was curious. That I now realize I can explain uh, with the language of a populated universe that at the time, 35 years ago, I had no idea what they were. And I think that's the case for, for many people from a faith background. I don't think you could sit a single family down and ask the question, has any of us ever experienced something we couldn't explain? Every family, every network of friends would have people who would say, yes, I've had this experience. And in the past, I had no way to explain it. With the language of ET contact with the language of a populated universe, with the language of all kinds of beings, interdimensional, extra dimensional, extraterrestrial. Perhaps we do have the frameworks to explain the things we've all experienced, but it's often the power of the fear of ridicule that keeps people from sharing their stories in these circles. And one of the reasons I wrote Escaping from Eden was to try and break that taboo again, to get us talking and listening, because I think if we really did that, if we really did ask those questions of our friends and family, there would be no family anywhere that does not have a, an encounter telling us that we're not alone in the universe. Totally, totally agreed. Most people think that, well, this is it has to be a bad thing because if I understand, if I know everything, then I would know that this is good. And because I don't know it, they automatically put a negative slant to it. Most people in in that regard, they live in separation. They look out, even scientists, some, they look out to the universe and they're expecting to see civilizations on these planets, uh, particularly thinking that they, these planets exist, one, within our bandwidth so that we can mm. see physical structure. We can see people walking around with the Hubble and we, we would see all that if they were there. What they fail to realize is the unity that happens in a spiritual consciousness, which is, it's life that spins the planet in the first place. You're not looking for life. Life is ex existing. We know that scientifically. Without life, the, span is, the planets do not move. But they are also not seeing the fact that, you know, these beings, these higher level, lower level beings, they're just simply living on a bandwidth or reality structure that is beyond our sensory input is able to take in dogs, uh, hear things we don't, cats see things we don't. So I think they're not allowing themselves, as you said, one, of ridicule. And because of that ridicule, it's so strong in nature for most people, as soon as something off the chart happens, 
it gets dismissed just like that. There's not even a thought process to it anymore. I'm going to get laughed at. And I know this because when I was a kid, I told people, blah, blah, blah. It becomes default. And so it always gets pushed to the wayside, these truths that we're simply not alone. There's just no way possible. Absolutely. No I, love, possible. I love what you say about bandwidth. I mean, it's very true, isn't it? I mean, you will have a radio that can pick up radio waves between certain frequencies. Our eyes pick up light between I was going to bring up the point you did that our dogs hear things we can't hear our cats see things we can't see and there is language for that in in world mythology if you go to ancient Celtic mythology there's the concept of the seethe which is the other time and it's it's eternity but what they're talking about is a parallel universe that is just operating at a different vibration to ours so we can't see it touch it feel it it's it's out of sync with ours but it's in the same space as us and they would have spiritual exercises that they would undertake where they could get glimpses of this parallel world and it's the same when you go to aboriginal mythology uh, the stories of dream time are not stories about the past they're stories about the other realm and again they have exercises that are designed to help us perceive the other realm and get information from the other realm and in fact many of the ancient cultures that have curated these stories um, where the story of our evolution the story of our neighbors in the universe are hidden in plain sight these cultures that tell stories about our evolution being intervened in by visitors from other planets these same cultures all have practices designed to help us perceive and get information from a parallel dimension. And so you've got smoke and smoking ceremonies in some cultures, um, psychoaffective tea ceremonies in other cultures. Incidentally, that's where Plato got some of his information from. I've learned a practice of controlled conscious breathing which comes from the East, from Eastern religions and Eastern Christianity, Eastern Orthodoxy. And all these things are designed to shift our consciousness, to begin to perceive things that we don't usually perceive, but are there nevertheless. Paul, I really love your approach to all of this, out of this world stuff, if you will. I love it because it's grounded in scripture. It makes more sense. One thing I don't like about the UFO community, if, you, if I can use that way of describing, or this movement as the dark stuff, laying on a table and getting a bang up your backside because they're trying to abduct you, abduct you. Now, I don't doubt that that stuff exists and that it is happening. That is just not my field of extraterrestrial, ultra-terrestrial preference. I don't like it. You know, when I do interviews, sometimes they want to know what they look like. They want to know all these questions, but it's of a dark nature and it's simply a, a place I don't enjoy being. So I wanted to commend you um, in your approach to things about how it truly is important versus being an invasive kind of policy idea that there are others that are mean as harm. And I'm not saying that there are not others around who are causing us trouble and chaos and all this kind of stuff but uh, thank you for being someone who's grounded in this field well thank you i think the thing that's that's grounded me is that my start point has been from ancient texts um, so for a start this is helpful to me because this is something outside my own head this is stories that have been curated by cultures for thousands of years and when i go there i hear them all describing what I, in my book, I talk about a, a sky council. Now read the Bible, you'll find it there. It's referenced in Job, it's referenced in Genesis, it's referenced in 1 Kings. Um, what the sky council appears to be, you can find it in Greek mythology, Norse mythology, of course. What it describes is there's this little community of extraterrestrial species, if I can use very concrete language for it, they were all gathered around planet Earth, and they all seem to have a stake holding in, in Project Humanity. They have different agendas. Some of these entities uh, care about us and are very concerned for us. 
some of these entities are very indifferent to us. They're just here for other reasons. And some would appear to be hostile towards us. But they all sit together in this sky council, bumping up against each other in conflict. People of the Bible who read the Bible will be familiar with the story of the war in heaven, the war in the heavens. This repeats in mythologies all around the world. We find that conflict in Genesis 3, where one faction wants the humans more intelligent, another faction wants the humans so unintelligent they don't even know they're naked. And so there are various agendas represented by these different presences. Some are positive, some neutral, some negative. And to some extent, there's a kind of a stability in that arrangement. And I think when we have spats of experiences, spats of appearances, spats of traumatic things happening, it may be because there's a little bit of a breakdown uh, in that relationship going on. But I, I, I'm reassured by that picture because I think you're right. You know, you use the word alien, and the thing that jumps to most people's mind is the invasion of the body snatchers or Independence Day or, or some Mars attacks apocalyptic Act, act. <laughs> uh, and I am encouraged to realize that's not the whole picture. And for instance, when you go to a Native American story, many of the Native American peoples talk of people coming to us from the stars who help nurture us as a civilization. Um, the Cherokee would be an example of a people who talk about people coming uh, in our ancestral past and teaching us how to farm, what foods are good for eating, what plants are good for medicines, teaching us how to live on the planet and sitting with us for a while and helping us get on our feet. The uh, Mohican people have a story of a time when something had happened that had pushed them into on inhospitable territory where they were struggling to survive. And then other beings arrive and the hint is they arrive interdimensionally to help them survive and give them new skills. So it's not all this horrible, violent, apocalyptic alien invasion. How many ETs? Lots. <laughs> I think Paul's call dropped. Let me call him back. I don't... Maybe we get getting interrupted by the system. You guys are no longer going to talk about this. <laughs> ah, it must have been a drop call. Let's see what happens. Welcome to Center of Light, everybody. Speaking with my guest tonight, Mr. Paul Wallace. I'm speaking about his book, Escaping from Eden. I'm wondering if he had an internet issue because he's not answering. Well, let me hang up and try him one more time. Paul is not available. He's got a green light. Call him again. <laughs> Tuesday night coming, Center of Light's guest is going to be Steve Burgess. Steve Burgess on Center of Light Tuesday night. I'm coming back really strong with Center of Light Radio. I've been missing it, but I did need the time away. I did need the time away. Um, for some reason, Paul is not available. I'm going to try him a couple other ways. Everyone, if you would take this time, feel free to go to, um, Paul's website, which I dropped in the forum. Try to get Paul back on the line. <laughs> it happens. Like I said earlier in the presentation, presentation and the interview, uh, my system went down via getting a... Windows 10 upgrade update. It jacked my entire computer, but I'm grateful thanks to Cecil McDaniel. Uh, I'm waiting on Paul. Uh, Tuesday night at Center of Light Radio is going to be Steve Burgess. I don't remember the subject. And also, Thursday night is going to be Alfonso. Wow, what a last name. Cola Suono. And we're going to be speaking about unicorns. I'm excited. Unicorns. I love it. Uh, maybe I should get Dr. Rex here on Center of Light L Radio if he would like to come on and speak about the fairies and the shamans and the archangels that he's been uh, around because of Nucleus 8. I don't think Paul is available. I think something happened. He might have been shut off. Um, system reboot. 
uh, maybe there's an electrical storm that shut his computer down. I'm going to try one more time. There he is. He's sending me a message, and there he is. Let's see if he's back. Okay. Where were we? Are you back, my brother? <laughs> Hang on. Let me turn you up. I am back. What happened in your opinion? Did we go through one of those wormholes? And <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Welcome back, sir. So we dropped off. What were we talking about when we dropped off, Keith? We were talking about uh, the different aliens. How many... I mean, I'm sure it's infinite, but let's just find a number that's tangible, hanging out in local Earth space. Uh, good, bads, what? Yeah, I. that's a good question. So, I was coming across at least three species that are being identified. I looked through other texts, and, and it looks like it's about five. Uh, and then I think if you start listening to what... Um, other other countries, political leaders who dare to speak about this, sometimes identify a number of species that they say we're already in contact with. Uh, we're not quite there in Australia or the UK or in America. We haven't quite reached that level of disclosure. But I would take note, for instance, of the words of the late Edgar Mitchell, who uh, the sixth man to walk on the moon, Apollo astronaut, and in my opinion, a, a man of greater courage and integrity you could scarcely wish to find. And mm. he spoke in terms of our being a, a disabled part of a community of spacefaring civilizations. And he campaigned because he wanted the government to declassify its material regarding the ET presence so that we as the human race can take our place in this community of spacefaring civilization. So again, there's a plurality of races or species being suggested there. And bearing in mind that Ed Mitchell would have been bound by layers and layers of official secrets laws, and that's what he was allowed to say. Uh, so you can only wonder what he would have longed to say. A little earlier, Paul, you were talking at the very beginning, in fact, you were mentioning how scripture, going back into it with a new intention, a new vision, a new attitude to see what is actually there. You'd put uh, certain things or at least alluded to the idea that certain scripture is all or at least at that in that moment, in that particular passage or so about sky people, if you will. A friend of mine told me this many, many years ago. He says, let's look at the story of Moses. <laughs> when he went up on the mountain, when there was fire in the mountain, he said, Jehovah told him, I'll come back soon. And when I come back, I will come in all of my glory. Jim Powell told me this. And he said, Keith, look it up. And it took me a while and I found it. I think it's Hebrew in some strange dialect, whatever it is. The word glory means heavy thing. I will come back in my heavy thing. Do you know anything about that passage, sir? I know something about that word, and I think your friend is quite right. That <laughs> word glory gets used in another text in the Hebrew Scriptures, and it's the perhaps well-known close encounter experienced by the prophet Ezekiel. He has this experience where he is taken up into the air in a craft and flown around. And he describes the process. He describes the craft. And it's funny because all the time that the prophet Ezekiel is having this experience, the pilot, who he says was like a human being, that's the language he uses, the pilot is trying to talk to Ezekiel about religion and politics. And all the time Ezekiel is distracted because he's looking around at this craft, trying to work out how it works. How do these wheels move what is this crystal clear canopy that's over us what's that roaring noise that happens every time we move and he describes this craft with two words and one means a habitation the other is the glory we moved around in the glory well what's that it's a <laughs> word for something physical it's a word for a spaceship let's put it out there 
And uh, there's a wonderful story of a NASA engineer. He was a senior engineer for NASA, Eric Blumrich, who was uh, confronted with Eric von Daniken's interpretation of that text. And he didn't believe it. And he said to Eric von Daniken, you're not going to find descriptions of technology in the Bible. The Bible's a spiritual text. But he was challenged to go back and read Ezekiel. And being an engineer, he started drawing up schematics for what Ezekiel describes. And he realized that he was being shown something technological that was really quite viable. And he was so convinced by this that he wrote a book called The Spaceships of Ezekiel. So there you are. There's another encounter with something technological, something flying, something extraterrestrial, flown by something like a human being, and it's called the glory. So you've got the <laughs> parallel between yeah. this entity telling Moses, I'm going to come back in my glory next time. If you're impressed with this little ship, wait till you see the mother ship. Yes, the story of Ezekiel really does confirm that reading. And it's again, it comes down to this matter of translation. Well, we've become very used to reading certain words, uh, whether it's translated into the English or we're reading the original Hebrew. We translate it in, in a particular way that makes us feel like we're reading a religious text. But there are plenty of moments uh, that if you can come at it with uh, uh, an engineer's mind, you realize we're being shown some mysterious form of technology. Let me run this by you, sir. We look at stars, constellations, the Pleiades, Orion, these local spaces, not so local. And then along comes whoever it was, what is it, like in the 1600s, was it Copernicus, or who, what, whoever it was that names these constellations. Maybe I'm way off the mark here, but maybe you can help me out. Why would the Bible... 2,000 years ago, give or take, how many times, how much it actually took to unfold in its fullness. Talk about the Pleiades, the Orions, the Arcturians, and there was another one. Well, Keith, thank you so much for asking me that question because this uh, very week I'm working <laughs> on the chapter <laughs> in the sequel to Escaping from Eden that asks that same question because when you read enough uh, ancient world mythologies, you realize that certain constellations keep coming up. Now, the ancients had names for those constellations. Okay, okay. But the three that keep getting associated with human beings and with ET visitors are, as you say, the Pleiades, Orion, the Sirius star system. They keep getting repeated. And in the oldest book in the Hebrew canon, the book of Job, it's a mystery of a book. Scholars believe it's actually an Arabic book that's made its way somehow into the Hebrew canon of literature, the ancient Hebrew library. There is a verse in the book of Job that talks about the Pleiades, Orion, and Sirius. And this uh, speaker is talking to Job, and he says something along the lines of, can you overpower the influence of the Pleiades? Can you overpower the influence of Orion? Can you overpower and control the influence of Sirius? And it's a really, really intriguing verse. I'm drilling down into that translation right now. And wh why would those places have an influence over human beings? Is it really just talking about the influence of the stars over the seasons? I don't think so. It's very concrete language. It all has to do with the control of humanity. Pleiades, Orion, Sirius, and human beings. Can you stand up against that? Why? Why those three? Why the three that occur in mythologies all around the world to say people from those places came here and some of them colonized us, some of them controlled us, and some of them helped us? Little clues like that begin to open up when you slow down and ask the question, what is this about? Where is Enoch in all this? <laughs> I oh. met Enoch. I, I, no joke. In a, in a soul experience, I was aboard his craft. We'll get into that at some other point. So it, let's talk about you. Where is Enoch in all this? He's just taken in a whirlwind to God? <laughs> yeah, Enoch is really, really intriguing. Um, 
the Book of Enoch, which is a part of the, um, the canon of the Old Testament in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, is an old, old book. We're not quite sure exactly how old it is or where it came from. We know how old the current version is, but it seems to tell an older tradition. The Book of Enoch, whoa, it is, uh, there's a lot in it. <laughs> There's a lot in it. There are a lot of familiar religious themes to do with the religion, politics, salvation, so on and so forth. But then there's this other narrative in there that seems to talk about the arrival of beings, um, watchers, who have uh, broken some uh, law to do with the relationship of beings off planet Earth and beings on planet Earth, and they come. And in part, they help us, they teach us things. But then there's this hybridization that goes on that's really controversial. And what happens in that storyline is really an unpacking of the Genesis 6 moment, when the Bene Elohim, the sons of God, or, or the ones like the powerful ones is what I think it means, come and interbreed with humans, and it causes a huge conflict in the Sky Council. It's there in summary form in Genesis 6, and it's told so quickly, you would think the reader is assuming we know the story already from some other source. You go to the New Testament, and in the book of Jude, when the writer of Jude wants to allude to the story of Genesis 6, he quotes the book of Enoch verbatim. And so what that tells us is that Jude and many of the early church fathers, like Clement of Alexandria, assumed we all are familiar with that book. And as I say, the book unpacks in much greater detail the story of E.T. abductions, you could call it, and human E.T. hybridization. And it seems a really far right, you know, you say that human E.T. hybridization, it sounds so extreme, <laughs> You're right. so hard to process. And yet, it is probably the theme that recurs most frequently from culture to culture in the ancient narratives. From the chat room, we got just a couple of minutes. Maybe you can just glaze over this if this is something that you are familiar with. Robert uh, asked a question. Ask him about Goetta. Oh, dear. I'll have to ask Robert about that because he may know more about that than I do. That's G-O-E-T-A, Goetta, Joetta. Uh, thank you for being a phenomenal guest on the channel. I feel that we are not, we're complete for tonight, but I don't think we're complete yet, bro. I want to get you back and we do a part two and go down your other bullet point question list. And maybe for if you sure. dare, we can delve a little deeper into uh, the possibility of what's coming down the pike for you, sir. Oh, definitely. That would be great fun. There's so much more to talk. And it's so topical right now with the revelations of 2019 and 2020 from the Pentagon, from the U.S. Navy. There's so much that's out there at the moment that people are puzzling over. And I, my belief is that Genesis and our world mythologies answer a lot of those questions for us. Would you be so kind to raise up that book so our listening audience, viewing audience can see that amazing work tell everyone please yeah. where they can get this book anything you want to say closing comment sound off with yeah, uh, your sure. websites or whatever you need sir we'd love to see you in a closing comment yeah escaping from eden if you haven't read it it's a lot of fun it's a book that can take a reader from zero interest in this topic to coming away knowing wow there's something real i've got to think about here it's an easy read if you go to my website which is paulantonywallace.com. That's Anthony with an H, Wallace, W-A-L-L-I-S, paulantonywallace.com. Go to the Paul Wallace channel on YouTube. Watch the Fifth Kind TV on YouTube. You can go to fifthkind.tv for our website. That will keep you up to date. Soon you'll be hearing about the sequel that will be in the pipeline and out on the shelves very, very soon. Sir, keep me uh, in contact of what you're doing. I'd love to get you on in a couple of months, see where we are, and play some uh, conversational volleyball. Definitely will. It's been great fun being with you today, Keith. Thanks so much for having me on the show, and I wish you every success with homecoming. Bless. Uh -huh. Thank you, sir. Blessings, my friend. Everyone, Keith Anthony Blanchard here, Center of Light Radio, as my friend Paul just mentioned. He's from down under. Maybe one day when things get really good, I'll go pay him a visit and sleep on his couch. Homecoming crossing, can't see it, I got a white screen going on. Homecoming crossing the bridge to the soul. Doing very well, number six in the UK at the present moment.
I'm grateful. I'm thinking about doing another push. Maybe I need to stop pushing. Maybe it's time to relax. Thinking about that. So Center of Light Radio. Tuesday night, Steve Burgess is going to be here. Uh, Thursday night. Uh, let me see me grab this guy's name one more time. Uh, Alfonso. And we're going to be speaking about unicorns. Exciting. It's a little bit out of my territory. But I love the possibility. That's for sure. Keith Anthony Blanchard here, Center of Light Radio. I'm looking for my closing screen because I love my music. Let's see. Where is my music? Oh, well. I'll be seeing you soon. Peace, love, and always remember, live in the light. You are the light. Why not just simply <laughs> be with it consciously? Chat with you soon. i